Good evening. It's a pleasure to have all of you here at the LSE for part of our International Growth Week and the excitement of a speech by Trevor Manuel from South Africa on sustaining inclusive growth in Africa. I'm Craig Calhoun, I'm the director of the school, and I just want to welcome you to this occasion and tell you that Trevor is the highlight of an occasion that is a very big one for the school. We're celebrating the launch of the second phase of the work of the International Growth Center. The International Growth Center is an extraordinary activity that we're very proud to host at the LSE and to run in collaboration with Oxford University for the Department for International Development, UK Aid. What makes this exciting is that it creates a remarkable network of the world's leading economists focused on growth and a variety of related issues in economics. And this network is oriented to first-class research in support of really effective public action. It's not just academic research. It is academic research of the highest caliber that is also practical and is connected directly to in-country activities in 13 centers around the world where teams of economists and others work on specific national issues in collaboration with the national government and their colleagues in the country. It's building thus very specific knowledge and a more global knowledge base for sustainable growth around the world and particularly in some of the world's countries which have tremendous need of growth to sustain populations, to sustain development trajectories that are incipient, and to keep the regional economies uh, stable. Now, this is a tall order. The issues of development and of growth have been on the agenda at least as long as the LSE has been around and longer. But we are seeing, I think, a remarkable set of forward steps and they are in no small part because of the successful collaboration of top-level academic researchers with people who are engaged in practical action around the world and the learning that comes from that. It's learning for the academics who are stimulated to see new issues by the practical concerns that come to their attention. It's a learning for uh, people in a variety of different agencies and leadership positions. So we're thrilled by this at the LSE. We're thrilled because of the exceptional quality, because it's global, because it connects to real human needs. We also are pleased that there's a new and old collaboration in the leadership of the International Growth Center. It was founded by our uh, by economists from the LSE in Oxford, as I led especially. Um, we have with us Robin Burgess and Paul Collier, the key founders of the program, and it's had a steering committee from the beginning of outstanding economists. But it also has just recruited a new executive director, and we're pleased to have Jonathan Leap here tonight um, for this. So I'm not going to talk at any more length about all of this. What I want to do is to invite our colleague from DFID, from the Department for International Development, Tony Burden, to come and say a few words about this. Tony is himself one of the major experts in this field, um, as well as leading the important work of DFID in growth and sustainability issues around the world. So what I'd like to invite him to do is to say a bit about DFID, but I want you to welcome him and appreciate the quite remarkable support that DFID has shown with one of its largest grants ever for this enterprise that is such an exciting success. Tony? Great, thank you. Well, I'm really pleased to, to be here uh, this evening. And I feel a bit like one of those speakers who's between you and your lunch or your dinner. And I'm between you and Trevor, uh, who I admire greatly and um, had the great fortune to work with in the Commission for Africa. He's one of Africa's great ministers. And uh, it's fantastic, Trevor, that you've come here today to speak at this event. Um, you know, for DFID, we're, we're terrifically proud of the IGC. Um, it's a fantastic institution and it, it's deeply needed um, and I'm really pleased that we've been able to support a second phase 
and as Craig said, with a very large grant, um, and very pleased that we've you know, got a new executive director, Jonathan, very pleased to be working with you. It's fantastic. And really our vision for the IGC is to have a world-class institution that's playing a major role in advising developing countries. And there's a huge gap in terms of um, technical advice, bringing research and academia into really looking at the policy environment and what's needed. And I think the IGC is unique globally in playing that role. So we, what we want, our vision, is a world-class institution. And, and why is that important? Well, you know, you're, you're all here in, in the LSE, so you know that no country has reduced poverty without raising economic growth. Um, it's growth that creates jobs, that raises incomes, that provides the tax to pay for the services in health and education and in infrastructure. Now, our Prime Minister has just co-chaired uh, a panel, a high-level panel, looking at the uh, post-2015 uh, Millennium Development Goals, a new framework to harness uh, a focus on international development across the globe. And their vision in that high-level panel report uh, was a, a world free of poverty by 2030. So a very ambitious goal which, if adopted in the UN process now, underway, uh, negotiating new goals, but if adopted, it will be growth which will be at the core of achieving that goal. Much higher growth, much better quality growth, and also efforts to tackle structural barriers to very poor people like gender and so on. Growth's a priority for my Secretary of State. She's asked DFID to ramp up its economic growth work, and we're looking at how we do more of that. Um, and, you know, it's when I think of some of the challenges and some of the opportunities that are coming up around the world today, it'll be institutions like the IGC which will be able to analyse those issues and come up with the kind of research and policy advice that countries need. So if we look at where poor people are in the future, they're increasingly going to be located in fragile states and in middle-income countries. So the IGC will need to think more about these hard-to-reach countries, but also about middle-income countries who could finance their way out of poverty, but sometimes don't yet do so. And maybe that's where really brilliant policy advice is needed. Um, by 2030, more people in Asia and Africa will live in urban areas rather than rural areas. It's a massive opportunity to raise growth, create more jobs and reduce poverty. Um, we've got a one-off opportunity from a demographic dividend where the, the number of dependent children relative to people of working age is shifting in Africa and in Asia. A huge opportunity to create jobs and employment and raise growth. And of course, you know, commodity prices in Africa are fueling growth, but we need to make sure those resources are well used and invested well. And again, the IGC can offer help in this, in, in this area. So I think what's distinctive about the IGC is that it's demand-led. It's governments asking for advice that they need to develop their policy. And it's, it comes without any baggage, without any funding, um, and that independent advice is what's really unique and key, and it's what governments really value. So, I mean, I'll just finish, really. We're looking forward to this next phase, to the growth of the IGC, to seeing more of this advice used by different governments. Um, and we really do believe that the IGC is in a unique position to do that. So I'll hand over to you now, Jonathan, but thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Tony. And, uh, Craig for the welcome. Let me say just a few words about uh, the IGC uh, first as we sort of formally launch our second phase and then also um, introduce you to tonight's speaker. The mission of the IGC, as many of you know, is to promote sustainable growth in developing countries and to do that by providing demand-led policy advice based on frontier research. It's an initiative that responds 
to a problem that in a general sense faces all countries, which is how to feed evidence into policy, how to work towards policy that really is uh, evidence-based and evidence-driven. And, and the recognition that that's a problem that's acute for many developing countries. Because in many developing countries, that problem of feeding evidence into policy is exacerbated by research gaps, gaps in the relevant research knowledge in country. Um, and those research gaps are often in turn compounded by a lack of access to international networks of, resources, of, of uh, researchers. So this problem of feeding evidence into policy becomes more, more serious, potentially much more serious in the developing country context. But there's another problem, and that is that that lack of access to international networks has a cost on the other side, that is on the knowledge creation side, that many researchers simply don't have access, don't have direct access to the kinds of policy challenges that are facing developing countries. And as a, fa as a result of that, then ideas don't get generated, knowledge doesn't get created. So the idea of the IGC is really a simple one, is to try to address that problem, to address that problem that if we want to have knowledge creation that will lead to ideas relevant to growth policy in developing countries, and if we want that knowledge then to be put to the service of policy and to feed systematically and effectively into policy, then we have to bring together top researchers and senior policymakers. And that's really what the IGC is all about. And the reason that we're so grateful to DFID is that what's special about the IGC is a new model for making this, this sustained engagement work. And that new model is about combining an international network of top researchers in growth and development with a set of country teams embedded in our 14 partner countries. Those teams, which are led by country directors um, and supported by country economists, and then in turn by, by our own uh, teams here in the hub, are in a position to facilitate these contacts and this knowledge translation and knowledge exchange in both directions. In the first instance, to bring in top researchers and to facilitate contact with policymakers in a context of local knowledge accumulated by that country team so that the researcher is in a position to understand better what the key research questions are that can feed in effectively and productively into growth policy decisions. So the country team in the first instance is making that connection from the policy environment and the economic environment and policy makers to the researcher who may be located at MIT or, or Princeton or Warwick. And then, at the end of that process of knowledge creation, to facilitate uh, the, the passing of knowledge in the other direction back into the policy process. So, accompanied by translation of that knowledge, perhaps, but to bring those researchers into direct contact with the policymakers so that the findings of that research really work to inform policy. And not only that, because our teams also seek at the same time to create within each country not only a set of informed policymakers, but a broader informed debate about growth policy. So to work with uh, private stakeholders, uh, to work with universities, and to work with the third sector, with NGOs. So that we have a developing uh, debate within countries that helps to secure policy gains in the longer term and not just in the short term. Governments change, and it's important that our engagement be sustained over the long term so that it isn't just the fact that we convince one minister that she should do something slightly differently, but that we create a more informed debate in country so that over time better long-term decisions are made regardless of the government uh, in power. We, as uh, you may have heard, have recently agreed the final uh, outlines of a new research strategy for phase two and I want just briefly to uh, set out the, the four themes that make up that strategy and we'll be sending you the electronic uh, version of that file uh, over the next day. Um, but it really is going to be the focus of a very exciting program over the next four years. Building on the research done in phase one and the demands that we saw coming out of countries in phase one. We've designed a research strategy now on four 
areas that builds directly on those done over the previous four years. The first of these is state effectiveness. And state effectiveness really is, is the recognition that without a functioning effective state, it's really very hard for, for any development to take place, for the private sector to, uh, to operate uh, effectively. So the state effectiveness is in a sense the starting point and there are two different streams within that. One stream which looks at public finance questions, questions of effective taxation and compliance and enforcement. And another that looks at effective expenditure and how governments can spend uh, more effectively, incentivize public workers more effectively and so forth. And then another side which looks at governance questions and political economy questions. How can we secure a higher degree of transparency and accountability and in that way shape policy uh, in the long term? That's the first area. The second uh, and broadest area is firms, which brings together a whole range of research that was undertaken in the first, uh, in the first phase of the IGC. So it includes, on the one hand, work with very large firms. Uh, John Sutton's work mapping the large enterprises across African countries and distilling from that understanding of how large firms develop. Uh, is it that uh, entrepreneurs become large firms or does the Google of Africa remain stuck in the garage? In which case we need to think differently about entrepreneurship and about how firms grow. But also combining with that work on uh, managerial and firm capabilities and, and the differences across firms in terms of management and other things. Combining that again with entrepreneurship and bringing in the idea of farms as firms and how we can better understand entrepreneurship at that level, at that very uh, basic level, and of course combined there with the uh, very important work that Robin and Oriana and others have done on the ultra-poor and the approaches to basic entrepreneurship in that way as well. And then two new areas under the research uh, program. The first is uh, cities, and here recognizing that urbanization is a major challenge facing our partner countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia. If we look around our partner countries and elsewhere in the region, we see dysfunctional cities. And the question is how can these problems be most effectively addressed? And finally, energy. One of the greatest obstacles to growth across uh, all of these countries is problems of energy, problems of access to energy, problems of energy theft problems of sustainable, identifying sustainable energy sources, and problems of managing the considerable externalities associated with the sharp increase in energy that will occur as, as our countries uh, develop. So energy is the fourth theme. I'm delighted to say that uh, oh, at the beginning of next week, we will, have, we will launch the first open public call for research under these program areas. So in a change from phase two, we want to reach all researchers who may be working uh, in these areas and interested in, in doing more. And we'll be launching a series of calls uh, under this, which will be bringing together not only the central research program, as I've just outlined, uh, but also uh, research from each of the country teams. And through using this new system of open large calls, we hope really to get the best possible pool of researchers that will be working both on the country research programs and on the central research program as well. Well, let me switch gears now. It's my great uh, pleasure both to, to be chairing, but in particular to be introducing uh, the evening's uh, speaker. Before I do that, let me just quickly uh, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Francesco Caselli, who will be the discussant. Francesco, as you uh, no doubt know, has worked widely in the area of growth in a number of different areas, including productivity uh, differentials, but also the political economy of natural resources. And he'll be offering some observations after the main lecture. Our main lecturer, as you know, is uh, Trevor Manuel, who is a minister in the presidency of South Africa and former uh, Minister of Finance. Few public leaders have made such important contributions on both national and international levels across such a broad range of areas over such an extended period. Uh, Trevor Manuel began his political life early as an activist in the Western Cape 
in the late 70s and throughout the 1980s, at a time when there was a very important dual challenge to the apartheid regime. There was an external challenge, and the ANC, for the most part, was based uh, uh, externally, um, and there was an internal challenge, and Trevor was um, at the forefront of the internal challenge, which together uh, really precipitated uh, the transition in South Africa. Once that transition began in, the 19, in 1990, um, he was appointed the head of the Department of Economic Planning uh, for the ANC in 1991, that same year elected to the National Executive Committee, which he remained a member of for many, many years, and I think almost always, if not always, in the top five of the list. Uh, so one of the most influential members of the ANC over a very extended period. In 1994, he became Member of Parliament and was appointed Minister of Trade and Industry, and two years later was appointed Minister of Finance, a position he held for 13 years until 2009, making him one of the longest serving uh, finance ministers. And at that point in 2009, he switched to his current position as a minister in the presidency and head of a national planning commission. As finance minister, he guided South Africa through its most difficult transition, uh, that is immediate post-election, uh, to a new economic policy framework and then more broadly to a new policy framework because as, as masters of the budget, uh, the, the Treasury the Defense Ministry really guided the whole process of policy in that uh, post-apartheid, uh, initial post-apartheid period. And he really established both the macro stability but also more broadly the policy framework that really saw South Africa move so successfully through that transition period. But all of that's just his national contributions, and I've already mentioned that his international contributions have also been very important. I, I don't have any time to list all of these things, uh, but let me just give you a few of them. In 2005, he chaired the Development Committee of the World Bank. Um, he had earlier served as Special Envoy to the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference for Financing for Development, uh, and also as a Commissioner in the International Task Force on Global Public Goods in 2003. He served as a commissioner, as Tony's mentioned, of the, the um, Commission for Africa from 2004 to 2005. He served on the Commission on Growth and Development as commissioner from 2006 to 2008. He chaired the G20 meetings in 2007. He was appointed a special envoy for development finance by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2008. And he served as co-chair of the uh, Oceans uh, Commission as well as chair of the committee that reviewed the doing business uh, uh, rankings uh, of the World Bank. He's received uh, too many honorary doctorates uh, to even uh, enumerate, much less mention, uh, has been twice uh, awarded the African Finance Minister of the Year. If I can end on a personal note, I've had the privilege of working with him uh, for a period of almost two decades through a research group that was engaged, that I've been involved with here, that was engaged in South Africa, and have been unfailingly uh, impressed by both his openness to new ideas and to, uh, to research um, and his ability to engage very robustly and to challenge that um, in a way that ultimately has led to a policy development process institutionalized in South Africa uh, within National Treasury that has really generated a very strong stream of, of evidence-based uh, policy. Let me just uh, quickly make a couple of um, uh, housekeeping announcements and then I'll finish. Uh, the Twitter hashtag is hash growth week for anyone who wants to tweet. Uh, I want to remind you the lecture is being recorded uh, online. Uh, it's, it's being recorded and will be made available uh, online. Um, and with that, I'd like you to join me in welcoming the Minister, Trevor Manuel. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and may I join those in congratulating you in your appointment as new Executive Director of the International Growth Center. As you pointed out, uh, we've worked together over many years. Uh, Jonathan wasn't born gray. He was young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. <laughs> uh, and, and part of the discussion that we could have this evening is that many of you would be involved, hopefully, uh, within the ambit of the International Growth Center and, and my engagement was always on the other side of it, requesting policy uh, and engaging uh, with that. And so it's a, a very great privilege for me to be here this evening. 
But I want to share my observations with you as an African, and uh, I've been very affected by the events in Nairobi over these past few days, and I want to ask you to join me in a moment of silence for those who lost their lives in Westgate Mall and around it. Thank you very much. I, I start there because when we look at policy and the impact of policy, frequently we look at this in, in the context of empirical data being availed and so on, but there are frequently externalities that impact very, very directly. Uh, and, and pause for a moment and reflect on policy makers in Kenya right now and ask just how much of a setback they've had and, and understand that these issues are fundamentally important as we try and take decisions about the world. You know much of what I'm going to say, so I suppose I can sit down and, and we can have a discussion about uh, uh, the issues. But, but let me start by talking about this last decade in Africa's life. It's been a phenomenally good decade. It's been a decade that clearly has been buoyed by uh, the commodity super cycle, but if that were all, then we would have lived through a commodity super cycle. I think what's important for us as Africans is to understand the changes that have happened. Uh, this week, uh, uh, all developing countries would, would uh, report at uh, the UN General Assembly on performance in respect of the Millennium Development Goals, and you can go and measure at the conclusion of this the significant changes from so many African countries in respect of at least three of the MDGs looking at poverty reduction, education and health care. The talk this evening is about trying to sustain growth and, and in many ways we, we need the same uh, kinds of toolkit that, that we would use um, uh, to get growth up but as we sustain growth, I think we need particular measures to ensure that we can have growth that's a lot more inclusive. And this is a very particular challenge when one is looking at issues such as commodities. Uh, frequently, frequently, uh, those who secure the, the permits for extraction are not even based on shore. And so managing these issues uh, is, presents very particular challenges and I think we need to be mindful of dealing with these issues in a particular way. Now, of course, I could, I could take up a lot of time this evening talking about the last 400 years in Africa's history, talk about colonialism, talk about slavery, talk about imperialism and, and talk about why Africa is still the poorest continent. But I want to start at a slightly different point. I want to talk about some of the factors that I believe actually gave rise uh, to this higher growth in the last decade. Um, and, and partly, and it will always arise in, in, in policy or, or in, in economic fortunes, I believe, uh, is, is the confluence of a series of factors. I don't know that uh, it's possible not even the best simulations, Paul, uh, can be as good as luck uh, in governance. Now, one of the big issues that we as Africans have going for us is the youth of our population. Um, many demographers uh, uh, suggest that uh, by 2050, the working age population of Africa will be larger than that of China. And so understand, understanding where we are right at the cusp of that is fundamentally important because it provides us with a continuity between what we've seen over the past decade and what portends if, if the issues are managed carefully. Secondly, um, it's important that we recognize that there have been very significant improvements in governance and democracy over the past 20 years or so. There are now fewer wars in the continent today. I make that point in spite of this tragedy that we've just reflected on. 
and there are fewer wars than there have been at any point in the past 50 years. While wars have not been entirely eradicated, the nature of the conflict has changed to become increasingly fragmented, smaller and more peripheral. The number of countries with routine and credible elections is growing. Peaceful transitions to power are becoming the norm rather than the exception. Though there are still a few quasi-dictatorships here or there, the norm is that there are elected governments. Uh, the very country we reflected on earlier, Kenya, went through a hotly contested election earlier this year. Uh, and the results, the results were accepted and in fact you would have seen on television yesterday uh, not only President Kenyatta but also the former Prime Minister Odinga come out and call for national support on this. And that, that says so much about the maturing of democracy on the African continent and that's an important measure that we need to take forward in everything else we do. On the economic front, um, better management has resulted in low uh, inflation, smaller fiscal deficits and relatively low levels of public debt. Now, some of this came at huge cost. There were difficult periods of, of huge instability. But when this came, and again, I'm saying it happened at a time of confluence, uh, 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 the, the, the gains are there for all to see. And I think that, that across the continent, many, many people will resist the idea of any, any attempt to return to those crazy imbalances of the past. In the past month, several African countries issued dollar-denominated bonds at competitive prices in international capital markets. Twenty years ago, this was unheard of. When we entered the capital market uh, as South Africa, um, at the end of 1994, uh, soon thereafter, uh, Botswana got, got an investment grade rating, but it was unknown. And now you've seen the changes as a consequence of some pretty tough macro decisions and better governance. Uh, but it's all, it's all coming together in a very distinct way. The third factor that has driven this resurgence uh, was, of course, the commodity prices. Uh, and also, uh, with that, the ability to attract a new foreign direct investment uh, uh, into access of, of raw materials. Now, Unlike previous uh, cycles, and there have been commodity booms uh, before, uh, the present cycle is having a wider impact on other sectors such as finance, retail, telecoms, transport and tourism. Uh, and when you look at, 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 I mean, lift out telecoms from that, you begin to understand just the strength of that part of services. Uh, big names. Uh, uh, from different parts, in fact, from strangest parts of the country, Sudan, Zimbabwe, uh, uh, IT companies that have grown, uh, the applications of, of IT in financial services in countries like Kenya, uh, all of it has just leapfrogged over the rest of the world. So these positives, I think, uh, are important that we recognize. We've also benefited from, from, from growth elsewhere, uh, uh, including uh, in China. According to the World Bank, the number of Af sub-Saharan Africans living on less than $1.25 a day fell by about 10 percentage points between uh, 2001 and 2012. Today, Africa is a small but growing middle class. Small but growing. 313 million of us uh, in the middle class now, which is essential for consumption growth as well as for building public institutions essential for growth. There are, of course, a number of questions that we must talk about uh, uh, how we sustain this growth uh, and, and the development impetus. The most obvious reason to question the sustainability of growth is because commodity prices have fallen and are not likely to rise to the same levels uh, uh, in the decade ahead. The question, of course, that we have to engage with is, is whether Africa can sustain the growth at, at a lower uh, a commodity price a trend line? My simple answer is yes, but. The next decade is going to be tougher than the previous one. In my view, there are four elements of sustaining growth and making it more inclusive. 
these are continued emphasis on growing exports in mining, agriculture, tourism, and other export-oriented sectors. Secondly, investment in infrastructure with two objectives in mind. Firstly, to enable the export of products, and secondly, to ensure that urban settlements become engines of economic activity through investment in water, sanitation, housing, roads, public transport, and broadband connectivity. Thirdly, investment in people through better nutrition, higher quality education, improved health care, and safer communities. And fourthly, continued efforts to build public institutions, sound governance, and high levels of accountability. Now, this coincides exactly with the four areas, four focal areas of uh, the work of uh, the IGC. Uh, I'm saying that, that what's likely to happen is that there's, there's going to be a smorgasbord of requests from a variety of countries to deal with these issues because this is what, what sustaining growth is going to entail. But these areas also broadly coincide with the work that was done by the Commission on Growth and Development, also known as the Spence Commission, that looked at, 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 at strong incidents of growth, um, identified high growth over a sustained period, asked what the characteristics were, and the, you come back to these kinds of issues. So I think that we're now at a point where all of this learning can be taken forward uh, and, and the timing is ex exceedingly good. The, the gist of the, the Spence Commission is that short periods of rapid, uh, rapid economic growth are not only enough to lift sufficient people out of poverty and to enable an economy to shift towards higher value added goods and services. In this context, we must look at the positive trends over the past decade <clears throat> as only the start of a process of growth and development that has many decades to run. Sustained growth is not automatic. It is the result of a continuous process of investing in human and physical capital and of strengthening institutions. What is the theory of change required to sustain growth in the African continent? I use two related frameworks. The first is broadly described as a capabilities framework. This is a work uh, made good and big by Amartya Sen. Uh, in the case of many countries, it would involve uh, human capabilities as well as the infrastructure capabilities. It's a wherewithal to be able to carry the country uh, to the next level. The second is uh, the structural transformation that focuses development efforts in the comparative advantage of poor countries. This refers to the investments necessary to shift an economy towards producing higher value added products. The transition is often a slow process. It requires investment in people and infrastructure. And frequently, the investment cycles and the cycles with which many of the multilateral bodies work don't take account of just the slow gestation periods that are involved. And that is why we've got to shift the thinking about what development actually entails. Government and public policies need to contribute to and facilitate the shift. Uh, it's not going to be automatic, uh, and, and, and I think that, that uh, uh, we will see that uh, markets don't always respond unless it is ready and available. So shifting the discourse is going to be fundamentally important. So for us as Africans, mining, agriculture, and other extractive industries play a dual role in the growth process. First, it generates the forex required for investment in infrastructure and technology in order to move up the value chain. And secondly, it provides employment and incomes to people to enable them to develop their, their capabilities and that of their children. Africa must see its people as its most valuable resource. The extraction of minerals is not an end in itself. Rather, it's an important means to that end. To put it simply, a country has to be able to expo exploit its present comparative advantages to generate the resources to invest in new capabilities and skills to be able to move up the value chain. For this process to work, several institutional and economic arrangements are necessary. Countries must be able to attract foreign investment into their natural resource sectors. This requires policies and regulatory institutions that are clear, trustworthy and predictable. 
Countries also require taxation and royalty regimes to be able to tap a fair share of the rent from the extraction and export of minerals. Thirdly, countries need sound public finance systems to be able to channel these rents into infrastructure, education, and health care. And this is frequently where the difficulties arise. Uh, they arise because countries don't have the skill set to be able to extract the rents uh, and record them and account for them properly and don't always have the public finance systems in place to be able to take appropriate decisions and be held accountable for them. So even when countries are able to attract investments, they often fail. More often than not, they fail to capture a fair share of the rent, or alternatively, when they do capture it, they don't have the institutional arrangements to spend the money wisely on future-oriented investments. The rent is consumed often by a self-serving elite. As I mentioned earlier, investment in infrastructure has two distinct purposes. The first is to enable the efficient production and exporting of goods produced. It often involves building power plants, rail lines, roads, ports and water schemes to facilitate the production and export of minerals. The second type of infrastructure is about building the economy of tomorrow. That requires an investment in urban environments, investment in schools, clinics, parks, telecommunications and public transport. The second category of investment enables living standards to be improved, but it also enables the service economy to grow and become more productive. Think of how many countries on the continent have uh, amazing uh, uh, extraction uh, uh, industries or extractive industries, but never convert that into this improved living space for people. Major source of growth itself is from the process of urbanization. Unplanned or badly managed urbanization reduces the effects of agglomeration and is bad for economic growth and productivity enhancement. Proper investment in roads, municipal utilities, housing and other amenities required for denser, livable areas will enable economies to transition towards higher value added products. Attention frequently arises about prioritization of infrastructure. Markets are often willing to fund something like a port development, sometimes with constraints, sometimes with, with strings attached. Uh, I know of instances where ports have been developed by large shipping lines uh, who offer comfort to their own fleet uh, but extract huge rents from others who need to use the port. So it doesn't make for balanced growth. But if companies are prepared to do that, they frequently aren't prepared to invest in the water treatment plant for cities. Sound policy will require a combination of public and private sources to invest in both aspects of infrastructure, those critical to extractive industries and those essential for human development and longer term productive growth. For both categories of investment, governments need to plan properly and build the capacity to execute efficiently. The issue of employment is a subject that dominates a discourse in developed countries. Much more thought and analysis needs to go into how to create jobs in, poor country, in a poor country setting. Economists often assume that economic growth on its own will create these jobs. It's not necessarily the case. A McKinsey report released earlier this year pointed out that only 12% of the population uh, of the African continent is engaged in paid employment. While there might be definitional, definitional debates about this figure, the basic truth is that too few people work either in formal or informal sec uh, sec sectors. More thought needs to go into the un understanding of the linkages between growth and employment. We also need to analyze the structural obstacles to employment growth. In some cases, these obstacles on the demand side include legal and regulatory disincentives to hire people into permanent jobs. In other cases, social issues such as housing, transport and childcare impediments to a fixed and formal labor supply. Africa had been largely successful in broadening access to school education. The evidence, however, suggests that the quality of school education remains poor. In some instances, growth in class sizes as a result of measures to improve access that contributed to declining quality. 
Delivering quality education to increased numbers of learners is not an easy task, and I have my own country as a good example of just how difficult it is to achieve this. It required both a competent administration and, a st and strong local accountability. It also requires knowledgeable teachers who are passionate and have the support of parents and administrators. As we've seen in some North African countries, improved education is not a guarantee of employment if the economy itself is not growing or if it's growing in a manner that's not consistent with employment growth. In these instances, well-educated young people either have had to leave or get frustrated with the establishment. These issues of urbanization, employment and youth development require countries to take a long-term perspective and develop the capacity to manage these processes in ways that are consistent with the development objectives of the country. They are not issues that can be resolved without intervention. They require foresight and concerted action over long periods of time. They require strong states who are able to partner with private investors to achieve mutually beneficial outcomes. The often forgotten reality is that Africa consists of 54 separate countries and independent countries um, much more needs to be done to integrate regional economies and to encourage trade. Today, many countries in the region export similar products and hence trade between countries on the continent is limited. In future, however, as countries move up the value chain and diversify, there will be a more organic demand for trade across regions. Without enabling infrastructure, such specialization and trade are not likely to occur. Efforts to develop supranational infrastructure have been hobbled by turf wars, regulatory obstacles, as well as a range of tariff and non-tariff barriers. One of the bridges that Africa can and must construct is that of regional economic communities. In spite of their long existence through the Lagos Plan and the Abuja Treaty, with notable exceptions, these have not developed as intended. The aim of all of this was designed to promote economic, social and cultural development as well as African economic integration as a means to increase self-sufficiency. It's important that African states revisit the models adopted to develop and maintain regional economic communities so that they can go beyond signing protocols, treaties and statements of intent. Africa must move to maximize the advantages that grow from larger organized markets that the RECs present. Countries do not get rich by selling goods and services to themselves, but by producing goods that the world needs and moving closer to the global frontiers. What is important also is to change the composition of exports to include manufactured goods. Concerted expansion of the productive capacity, including supply competitiveness and innovation, must be prioritized, and this must involve increases in intra-African trade in order to raise the level of trade between African countries. Despite these obstacles, the African Union is making progress in strengthening regional economic blocks and developing frameworks for cross-border investment in infrastructure. I have been involved in the development of the road and rail corridor, the so-called North-South Corridor, um, from, so from South Africa uh, up uh, effectively into the EGAD region of, of the Horn of Africa. We're making slow but steady progress uh, and the key objective is to reduce transportation costs. Low transport co costs enable the movement of goods beyond merely high value minerals. It provides the potential to open up huge areas for agricultural development. Let me conclude by saying the future for sustainable and inclusive growth in the African continent looks brighter than ever before. There are ever significant risks that have to be overcome. With sound policy, long-term planning and the development of solid institutions, Africa can translate periodic booms into prolonged periods of high growth. Africa has to keep this dual focus in mind, invest in the capabilities of its people and in the infrastructure required to shift its comparative advantage. These are mutually reinforcing uh, enforcing investments. We can we will and we shall do it. Thank you very much. So as an academic, 
when you are asked to go to a conference and act as discussant, that usually means that you stand up after the presenter has given his presentation and you proceed to explain why that was all nonsense. <laughs> now, I kind of suspected that uh, Minister Manuel wouldn't say anything that I would uh, find uh, difficult to agree with, and that has proved the case. Uh, so I did not interpret my role as discussant in this uh, more academic conference kind of way, uh, but more as uh, someone who will try uh, and probably fail uh, to uh, complement uh, uh, the Minister's remark with some additional uh, observations. So the Minister has focused on uh, Africa's uh, spectacular growth performance over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, and that's obviously uh, you could say that, that, that Africa has probably been the, the, the one source of pretty consistent good economic news over this period, uh, precisely because of this spectacular performance. We talked about the Africa's growth resurgence, uh, Africa's growth miracle. Uh, and these are kind of surprising words for someone whose formative years in graduate school uh, were characterized by describing Africa as a, a continent that was uh, mired in uh, decades of stagnation and was really struggling to, uh, to come out of that. So it's fantastic. It's been fantastic news indeed. Now, for any social scientist, uh, this uh, long-awaited transition from stagnation to growth uh, naturally triggers the question, why now? Okay, why, why do we get this growth uh, resurgence or this growth miracle now? Um, of course, a standard growth theory uh, tells us that countries which are far behind the technology frontier, uh, that have relatively little uh, physical and human capital, uh, should experience uh, fast and sustained growth. Uh, but Africa has, uh, for a long time, sort of, kind of failed to, uh, to behave as per the standard model, uh, and so indeed, we do need to ask why now, why, why we get this uh, finally uh, sort of Africa taking off. So let me briefly highlight uh, three narratives, uh, two of which have already been featured in, uh, in uh, Minister Emanuel's speech, and, and one kind of implicitly also. So the first narrative uh, obviously uh, focuses on primary commodity prices, uh, particularly, but uh, not exclusively minerals. Uh, these have been very high by historical standards, uh, and unusually persistently so. Largely uh, because of rising demand from large emerging economies in Asia and Latin America. Uh, these high prices have fed into higher income directly uh, by increasing the value of commodity exports, uh, but also indirectly uh, by spurring exploration and perhaps more importantly uh, by uh, spurring investment in infrastructure. And of course, uh, we've heard that they've also uh, fostered uh, uh, growth in uh, other uh, uh, service sectors like finance, for example, banking, IT, communications, and transportation. Uh, so in this narrative, in this particular narrative, uh, Africa is kind of riding on the coattails of China and other emerging industrial giants. So that's number, narrative number one. A second narrative has to do with governance and policy, and this has also been stressed by uh, Minister Manuel. For example, it has been argued that uh, many African countries have put in place a more stable and predictable macroeconomic framework uh, with more responsibility devolved to more independent and technically savvy technocrats, uh, leading to slower inflation and greater fiscal discipline. Uh, similarly, it is said that policy-making institutions in general uh, have become more accountable and transparent uh, thereby ensuring that policy is more focused on development and less on rent-seeking. And this has resulted, among many other things, in a more business-friendly environment. A third uh, narrative uh, is that the nature of technical change may have changed in a way that is more relevant to Africa's growth needs uh, than has hitherto been the case. Before the IT revolution, much technical innovation was concentrated in industries where African countries had little comparative advantage. And also, these innovations required large investments in human capital and infrastructure to be deployed uh, and taken advantage of. And to a large extent, IT, information technology, is susceptible to much broader applicability uh, and often requires relatively minor uh, prior investments. And the obvious example that everybody knows about is mobile telephony, 
Uh, but there are other ways in which uh, IT can contribute to African productivity, uh, both directly and indirectly, uh, by facilitating the diffusion of other technologies and, mo more generally, uh, knowledge flows. The three stories I have mentioned are perhaps the three most popular, but it is not difficult uh, to come up with uh, others. Um, some people see uh, the beginning of a reversal of the brain drain uh, from African countries, and of course China has played a role not only indirectly by boosting commodity prices, but also directly by investing in infrastructure and other capital projects. But my guess is that quantitatively, uh, these are less significant than the trio of commodity boom, uh, improvement in governance, and uh, technology that are more suitable for Africa's needs. Now, it is crucially important to note that these three African growth narratives are far from mutually exclusive. Uh, on the contrary, they are mutually reinforcing. Uh, perhaps they even depend on each other. In particular, as I will discuss in slightly greater detail in a minute, resource booms in the past have often been associated with greater rent seeking, deterioration in governance, greater social conflict. It may thus have been very lucky, a coincidence of good things, as Peter Emmanuel had mentioned. It might thus have been very lucky and critically important that the current commodity boom has come at a time when African governments were strengthening transparency and accountability. In turn, these improvements in governance may not be wholly independent of the spread of information technology, which not only makes for more informed citizens, but also enhance their ability to leverage this information and turn it into political mobilization, as we've seen repeatedly in the last few years. Hence, perhaps, <coughs> rather than three narratives, we have the making of a single narrative, where technological change contributes to better governance, through information and coordination, and the latter cautions the country from the potentially pernicious political side effects of the commodity boom. That such potentially pernicious side effects are very real has long been suspected by social scientists, but over the last few years, we have finally been able to mobilize robust empirical evidence on this matter. And this is an important change in, in economic research, one of the areas where the spin has been most progress uh, lately. Evidence from Brazil shows that municipalities in receipt of large royalties from offshore oil experience no gains in living standards compared to other municipalities and substantial increases in corruption. Evidence from Colombia shows that when oil prices increase, violence increases disproportionately in localities with oil installations. The latter finding has been generalized to a cross-country context in work that shows increases in civil conflict following large oil discoveries, uh, something called giant oil fields. Cross-country evidence also suggests that resource windfalls are associated with greater autocracy and that war between two countries is much more likely when there are oil fields near the bilateral border. These are recent developments in empirical work that mean that resource booms have clearly often been associated with increased rent seeking and corruption, movement towards more authoritarian forms of government, civil violence, and international conflict. And I am sure we can all think of African examples for this kind of developments in the not too distant past. As I said, unlike in previous run-ups in commodity prices, many of these political economy risks do not seem, on the whole, to have yet materialized in a major way in the current boom in Africa. And I think, by, incidentally, this is a great research question of why, at least so far, it looks like Africa has been politically more resilient to these resource booms than in previous booms. 
certainly many African countries have slowed, showed greatly increased awareness of the need to manage their newly found or newly valuable resources with the utmost transparency. It is crucial that this trend towards maximum accountability and transparency is maintained and strengthened if the resource boom is not to reverse Africa's recent gains in the quality of governance and its reduced proneness to civil and international conflict. But the risks associated with Africa's resource boom are not only political economic in nature, serious as those are. There are also some well understood market mechanisms that often greatly interfere with primary exporters' ability to turn resource windfalls into sustained growth opportunities. The inflow of hard currency leads to exchange rate appreciation as well as an expansion of the non-tradable sector, which has been uh, already mentioned. All the sectors that are booming are kind of non-tradable service oriented sectors. Both factors then lead to productive inputs flowing out of non-commodity tradable sectors into the commodity and the service sector. In the process, hard to build knowledge capital as well as marketing networks are lost. In turn, this means that when the commodity boom ends, as end it must, the country is in a worse position than before to grow its manufacturing sector. It is early to say whether Africa can escape these and other forms of Dutch disease identified in the theoretical and empirical literature. Data is scarce, and this is a major problem for macro research in particular in Africa. Data is scarce, but my impression is that in most countries the manufacturing sector, the manufacturing sector, is making a negligible contribution to the recent growth experience. Agricultural productivity is also not on an obvious upward path. And these are two potentially very worrisome observations. The question of what happens when the commodity boom ends is therefore a crucial one. And this, very properly, the minister has highlighted this. It's a very crucial one, and one that African governments need to give an answer to well before an answer is needed. I was delighted, though not surprised, to hear tonight that Minister Manuel is already leading this endeavor. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, on your behalf, I want first just to thank the Minister and um, uh, Francesca Caselli for very provocative and, and uh, stimulating uh, talks. And I'd like now to open it uh, to your questions. And I'd just ask you, when you do, if you do have a question, if you could please give your name and affiliation uh, before you begin. This is easy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that Africa is pretty scarce in is, uh, is what you might think of effective organizations, um, especially in the, in the business sector. Um, but South Africa isn't short of them. Um, South Africa is distinctive in having a lot of effective, substantial business organizations. Um, one of the things you didn't discuss tonight, Minister, is the, is the contribution that South Africa can make to the growth of the rest of Africa. Would you just like to comment on that in, in the light of whether it can spread its effective organizations across the, across the region? Thank you, Paul. Um, there are some parts of business organizations that rather not spread. I think that there are too many of them. Um, ultimately, I think that, that uh, uh, it's useful to get uh, uh, solid, strong, resonant business voices, like you have resonant trade union voices, coming together, talking through issues, and determining uh, how to settle issues. And if you don't have that, 
when you live through what we're living through now, which is a very adverse industrial relations environment. Um, the, I think that, that, that you know, um, in, in looking at South Africa, it, it, it's quite important to develop a perspective on, on concentric circles. Uh, one of the, the, the gifts, and I'm not quite sure if it was a well-intentioned gift, uh, from the departing British in 1910 was a customs union that we share with uh, Botswana, Lesotho, Namibia and Swaziland. And four of the countries share with us a common monetary union. So there's, there's pretty high level of, of, of uh, integration across uh, those five countries. And then we have, um, we are members of the Southern African Development Community. Clearly that that lends itself to, to greater organization because it includes outside of those countries, uh, Angola, the DRC, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, Tanzania, um, uh, Madagascar, uh, Mauritius, uh, Tanzania. Uh, so it's a, it's a very significant block, but I think that, that part of what we need is to be able to strengthen the institutional framework and pause and reflect on the size of, of Brussels uh, and look at what Brussels serves. Uh, and then, you know, we have a regional body sitting in Botswana uh, with just a few people. Uh, it's never quite going to facilitate the integration. But beyond, beyond those reaches, uh, South African firms are actually doing incredibly well across the African continent. Uh, it's hard to go into a capital anywhere and not find uh, South African brand names. Well, it's hard to come here and not find Nando's, for instance, but uh, uh, across the continent, uh, South African brands are big. The big, big issue for us is that we haven't reached a point, and it's fundamentally important for a whole host of reasons, economic as well as political. Um, the ability to get some sense of bilateralism in, in the way in which this expansion happens. Um, and that, that is something that requires a muscling uh, uh, that's quite different from what we've had uh, in the past. It does require strong government, strong business organizations outside of our borders, and then for partnership to develop on that basis. There's a hand over there. Thank you. I'm John from Ghana, Minister of Trade and Industry. Thank you for your presentation, Honorable Minister. In your presentation, you did mention about the Lagos Plan of Action. As a government minister, for over a certain decade now, the issue is we are not seeing political commitments to the implementation of this action plan. And as a result, it has created the inability to take advantage of the numerous trade among ourselves in the African region. This has culminated with a lot of barriers. Trading among ourselves around 12%. If we remove these barriers, it could increase about 26%. What, in your opinion, as a government minister, to be able to influence your colleague ministers to implement this action, Lagos plan of action to move African process forward towards regional integration. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your question. You know, at one level, uh, uh, ECOWAS, uh, that's the economic community of West African states, of which Ghana is a part, an integral part, uh, is actually very well positioned. Um, in relative terms, I know that one of the big barriers, and I've seen some literature out of that region that speaks of, of Africa as a francophone, anglophone, and I imagine that some of these issues are difficult in the region. But notwithstanding that, I think a country like Ghana is actually very well positioned to be able to construct different links. Now, of course, you're not going to trade uh, 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 cocoa with Togo and uh, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, but part of what, what we need to concentrate on is, is what the infrastructure links are going to be and how it's going to be afforded. 
the work that we've done uh, on the North-South Corridor uh, uh, present uh, in a way that it can be done, provided that the, the regional economic communities actually take this up, because, you know, the scoping has been, has been quite remarkable. Now, around uh, 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 the coast, uh, the Atlantic coast, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know that we should, we should tear down forests and, and, and build roads. We haven't actually started properly exploring um, maritime trade between countries uh, on the continent. And, and I think that this, this presents itself enormously. Uh, of course, there needs to be uh, uh, other, other transport linkages, like rail between uh, the coast of Ghana and, and the ability to move uh, uh, things like, like cocoa uh, to the coast. Um, but we haven't started exploring maritime trade and then opening up routes because sitting upwards from yourselves are, are landlocked countries as well and Ghana can play a very important role in unlocking that potential. But I think it's, it's the ability to work through the nitty gritty of that in the region uh, and unlock the potential in that way. I mean some of the, the, the borders are of course completely, completely artificial. Uh, the fact that Ghana is English speaking and Burkina Faso is French speaking uh, is, is a consequence of a border that was drawn uh, by colonial powers and not anything that, that arises from the people themselves, same people, different sides of the border. That's what we have to recapture as we deal with these issues. So we're not 54 countries, but we can realize economies of scale. Down here in the country, sir. Hi, I'm Charles from the IGC. If I'd like to um, draw on something Professor Caselli said, you said it's been a very f uh, fortunate thing that governance in Africa has improved at about this time, and it might be an interesting thing for future research as to why exactly that happened. Um, presumably you don't have an answer in mind, but I was wondering if I could just ask you to throw out some speculative reasons as to why you think that might uh, why that happened now. For you. For you? <laughs> 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 oh, he's a <laughs> You don't want to go? Um, <laughs> you first. Okay. Look, I mean, take, take, take the case of Ghana, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, go back to 1957. Uh, Ghana had lived through a series of coups. Uh, but there's actually less tolerance for that kind of behavior on the continent now. And so, uh, you know, just, just I, I mentioned uh, Kenya earlier, but uh, I know just a few weeks ago, uh, there'd been a contest because there was an election in Ghana in December or somewhere. Um, and the results came out. I think uh, the president got 50 point something and the 50.7 and the opposition leader got 47 point something. Uh, and when the court had settled, it settles and that's what defines democracy. And there's a lot more tolerance and I think there are far more good examples on the continent now. And that's what we have to hold dear. Um, which is why it's not surprising that, that uh, in the African Union, for instance, uh, coups are not tolerated. Uh, what happened in Egypt was described as a coup uh, and they've been suspended from membership of the African Union. These become important because that then provides a sustenance for uh, the electorate to, to, to make the choice. And what we have to do is to ensure that progressively we will build the institutions and the institutions that we can see, feel and touch are in many ways African now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's clear that there is overall less tolerance for uh, uh, lack, lack of uh, transparency and accountability, both externally uh, in terms of pressure from other African countries and countries outside Africa and organizations outside Africa. But also I think perhaps equally important 
an increasingly um, lower level of acceptance uh, of the deviation from this kind of behavior uh, domestically. And I try to speculate in my remarks that maybe uh, the diffusion of information and, and, and knowledge across the world, the technology has played a role in facilitating, might have also helped in shaping this <coughs> more demanding expectations from the even domestic public on, on the political process. <coughs> but I still think there is a lot to, to, uh, to research there to better understand this. And also, you know, time will tell whether this is really a done deal or whether it, it will be reversed. Thank you. Uh, Chris Blattman from Columbia University and IGC. Uh, so I think you're absolutely right. Coups are on the decline. And I would love to think that more and more countries are moving in the direction of Ghana. One thing that worries me is uh, several countries, especially in East Africa, are not only taking a page from China and Vietnam and other places in terms of growth, but in terms of political control. And what, what does that mean for democratization in Africa? And what, what path do you see for, uh, in the future? I, I, I don't think that even in East Africa there's a monolithic view. Um, uh, I'd mentioned the example of, of, of Kenya uh, where there was an election where uh, the, 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 the election was actually hard fought. Um, and until, until such time as, as the Electoral Commission had, had announced the results, uh, it was touch and go. Uh, question about whether Odinga's party would actually contest it in the court uh, was, was an open question for quite some time. So I don't, I don't quite know what it is you're talking about. Similarly, I mean, if you look at, at the situation in Tanzania, for instance, Chama Chama Pindusi has been in government uh, as a liberating party. Uh, but there's never been a question about the openness of the elections. Uh, in fact, if anything, now they're focusing very strongly um, on, on implementing the big policy direction they want to take. If there's a country that, that's working very closely with them, it's Malaysia, rather than China or Vietnam. Uh, trying to, to implement uh, this Pemandu approach uh, that the Malaysians talk about. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think that there's, 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 there's a single set of views. Uh, uh, we're talking this afternoon about the situation in Ethiopia. It's been very different. Um, but... Uh, you know, if there's something that one wants to measure in a country, uh, Bob Goldorf's not here, but those, those previous uh, uh, instances of, of drought and famine and, 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 and absolute devastation, um, hopefully uh, uh, Ethiopia will not live through that again because the investment in infrastructure will probably stand them in better stead going forward. So getting these balances right, uh, is, 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 is actually very interesting. Part of the challenge is that uh, frequently when, you know, when, when countries need to borrow, traditions look at borrowing headroom. Uh, and, and if they're close to the headroom, they can't get uh, resources from uh, the World Bank, for instance, for projects. Um, which is why uh, the idea of a BRICS bank presents positive alternatives. Uh, in the same way as uh, uh, Chiang Mai provides a, a pool of money in case Asian countries need an alternative to the IMF, uh, the development of the BRICS bank might present an, a, a different kind of alternative. Um, and, and it's engaging with, I mean, I think that in Ghana, when they were up against headroom for a hydroelectric scheme, uh, they actually borrowed from China. So these, these things can be done, but I think it's very important that countries have the wherewithal, have the policy direction, never give up on that, and maintain control over the direction that they need to take. 
Thanks. Uh, so you've just walked all the way down, but there was, there was a question here in the front. I'm sorry about that. Just in, I guess it's the third row. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Herbert McLeod. I'm from Sierra Leone and um, an independent consultant. Um, I want to start by thanking the speakers, um, in particular the Minister for sharing his optimism with, uh, with many of us. Um, at first I was worried when I saw the topic as sustaining inclusive growth, uh, implying that we already have inclusive growth and we need to sustain it, but fortunately you did not suggest that at all. Uh, rather you, you cautioned the need to actually ensure we do have in the future inclusive growth because if we did then it's a question of repeating what we did in the past and we inevitably will reach the same destination. In my country we've just launched um, uh, a program called um, the Agenda for Prosperity and uh, in organizing a conference for that, we said we now needed to find a new trajectory to take us to prosperity. But we also warned that when we go along the path, we should be very careful in observing the signposts because we did go through a path before and there were certain signposts. So if when going along this new path, we see the same signpost, we should question whether we are going to the same destination. So in sharing your optimism, I'm just wo wondering whether I have been interpreting some of the signposts that I've been seeing <coughs> in some of these countries in the last year or two as we bask in the sunlight of the growth, you know, the increased scandals, the uh, contested elections, uh, the, the rumors of, of coups in certain places, um, the huge infrastructure that are um, being constructed at twice the cost in some of these countries. Are these the signposts of the past? If they are, and I'm sure I am wrong, um, are you seeing signposts that are different? And could you tell us some of these and how we should ensure that if we do see some of those old signposts, we recognize what they are and do something about it? Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that there's, there's been a cataclysmic end to, to some of the things that people have been able to get away with in the past. But I dare say that it's, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, Paul Collier sitting here has done some tremendous work on uh, one of your neighboring countries in the region on Guinea-Bissau and iron ore, for instance. Uh, it's uh, a story worth telling. The fact that I, I can sit in Johannesburg and know about it, not because I'm a member of some deep intelligence network, but because these issues are now on the table, I think helps us understand the difference that resources make. It helps us understand why we as ordinary people should have the right to act against self-serving elites whether they are continentals or whether they are continentals who have been corrupted by outside agencies, the world must know these things. And so I think that uh, work, especially in resources, which help us understand where not to go, that provide us with those signposts, are fundamentally important in shaping our destiny. I think I'd like to add that to, one of the, to your earlier question, because uh, the fact that there's a lot more transparency about what people do uh, uh, certainly assists us uh, against the vagaries of the past. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. I'm afraid we've run out of time now for, for questions, but um, before we uh, thank the Minister, uh, I'd like to ask you, if you will, just to remain seated for a few minutes to allow the Minister uh, to leave. Um, but I'd also like you to join me now in thanking the Minister and uh, Professor Kazali for their time. <laughs>